kind of leader will she be? I'm joined now by three people who've worked with her or researched her story extensively. George Grills is political reporter at The Times and has written an all-encompassing profile of Trust, which is just one more reason you should have a Times subscription, then you can read it online. Kirsty Buchanan worked as a special advisor for Liz Truss at the Ministry of Justice, and Mark Littlewood from the Institute of Economic Affairs studied with Liz Truss at Oxford University. Um, welcome to you all. Let's start with you, George. Tell us a little bit about where Liz Truss grew up and, and, and what her childhood was like. Well, she moved around a lot during her childhood. Her parents, as we know, were university lecturers. Um, they were graduates uh, from Oxford who, who, who met then, um, maths lecturers. So she grew up a bit in Scotland, uh, a bit in Canada. She spent a year, but mostly in Leeds, in a, in a pretty affluent suburb of Leeds. Um, she's described her upbringing as being in a left-wing household. I think that's broadly fair to say. It was certainly sort of... Uh, they were out on CND marches, so campaigning for nuclear disarmament. But it was really uh, during university and, and towards the end of her university period when she moved from this sort of political leaning where, where she was with the Liberal Democrats more over to the Conservative Party. She described her time in Canada, I think. I, I'm not sure what age she was, about 12 or something when she went there. Right. She described that as a really formative experience, even though I think it was only for a year or so. Why was that? I think it was... Having come from, you know, an upbringing where there weren't that many opportunities necessary to go out and sort of meet different cultures and everything, it was one of those years which really opened her eyes to different political sort of persuasions, having been surrounded by, you know, other academic families, for example, who might have shared political leanings, suddenly she was sort of exposed to, to new ideas. So uh, certainly within her own myth-making, that, that's, that's seen as a sort of crucial year. Um, and tell me a bit about her parents, John and Priscilla. He was an academic, I know. Uh, tell me a bit about her mother. And I mean, unusually, maybe, you know, most of us tend to revolt against, uh, you know, our parents' beliefs at some point or other, but she seems to have very much gone along with them for the early period of her, uh, of her life. Certainly when she was in school, it was more at university where she started sort of... Um plowing her own way uh, but her dad in particular has sort of struggled to reconcile himself to her conversion to sort of conservative politics whereas her mum has been broadly supportive um, as she ran to be an MP and sort of helping out behind the scenes but you know we understand her father still a little bit disappointed by 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 the sort of political leanings that, that his daughter has espoused. Uh, much has been made of, of her um, similarity or attempt at similarity with, with Margaret Thatcher. And I know she had an early brush um, with Margaret Thatcher in that she uh, played Margaret Thatcher in a school debate and, and got zero votes and it said she didn't even vote for herself. So you think that might have put her off that pursuit. But there are also stories of her attending CND marches with her family and chanting Maggie, Maggie, out, out, out. Um, maybe that's where the repetition came from, actually. The punch up for repetition drummed in to her at an early age? Quite possibly. I mean, the, Ma the Margaret Thatcher sort of comparison is fascinating because obviously, you know, she was born in 1975, so she would have been pretty young at, at the time of when Margaret Thatcher was in power. But throughout uh, her political career, she's been a bit of a, a lodestar. And I was speaking to one former minister who was talking about when she had just um, got a junior ministerial role in government. And she was being very sort of uh, persuasive about arguments about childcare that was her sort of big uh, thing that she was advocating at the time. And the minister in question pointed to a picture of Margaret Thatcher behind Liz Truss and said, you know, you remind me of that woman up there on the wall. And Liz Truss turned around and apparently beamed and uh, like a Cheshire cat. Tell me a little bit about her time in Leeds then. She went to a state school there, which I think she's caused some controversy recently by describing as, as not a particularly good school. But actually, um, she got to Oxford as a result of, of, of attending that school. And that wasn't particularly uncommon as well. She sort of uh, tried to describe it almost as a sink school. I don't think that's fair. I think until the age of 16, perhaps it was, you know, your, your bog standard comprehensive. But after that in particular... For those who stayed on for the sixth form, it actually had schemes to sort of help them go to sort of really top universities like Oxbridge, and she certainly had some support to, to, to get to Oxford. And, it, you know, for her to sort of describe that as, some, as her sort of rags to riches to sort of story, I don't think that's, that's, that's quite fair. Um, she then went to Oxford. I, I'm not quite sure whether it was 
during school or, or, or during Oxford, but you spoke to people who she'd, I think, gone to school with uh, who didn't remember that they'd been in class with her. Was that, was that something that happened a lot with people who'd spent time with her in her youth? That was, that was the schoolmates more. Certainly she was shy. Perhaps that was a product of her having this peripatetic childhood where she was in Scotland and Leeds and, and, and around the world and briefly in Canada. But certainly by the time she was at university, people tend to remember her for uh, being the sort of life and soul, someone who was fun to be around, um, always sort of quick to engage in, in, in debate and enjoying the, the repartee of, of, you know, back and forth of Oxford debating sort of societies. So by that time, it, it felt like she was really coming to her own and, uh, and, and flourishing, really. Well, we can talk to someone who can confirm that for us both um, uh, in terms of Mark Littlewood, head of the Institute for Economic Affairs, who actually went to university with Liz. Uh, uh, the portrait that uh, we've painted so far, well, I haven't, but <laughs> George has. Um, does it ring true with you? Uh, describe the young Liz. Uh, she perfectly. certainly was anything but a shy, shrinking violet by the time she'd made it to Oxford University. I can't recall the exact first time I met her, and I didn't know her enormously well. Well, at Oxford, um, and um, but I do recall her being a force of nature when she arrived on the scene, and even I think in her first year, which I think would have been 1993, you're correct. Um, with, within months, she was a kind of recognised political figure in Oxford, as as much as you can be in the rather um, rather puerile word of student politics, but. She'd be mentioned in the gossip column of the student newspaper called Charwell. And the gossip column had a tendency of always giving you a middle name in quotes. And I think she was always Liz Popular Truss <laughs> because she had a tendency to put people's noses out of joint. I was always Mark Secondhand Car Salesman Littlewood, so I'm not quite sure what that <laughs> says about what I was like at university. Um, but sort of love or hate her, you couldn't ignore her. And my recollections of her, as I say, I can't remember the first time I saw her, was that she was opinionated, not necessarily in a bad way, but you, you would have no doubt at all where she stood on a particular issue or what she thought about a particular individual. And that made her unlike other Oxford Union wannabe politicians who tended to almost be the student equivalent of smiling and kissing babies and pretending to agree with everyone. Trust was not in that category at all. So you kind of thought, well, you know, she's opinionated, but does she have the kind of personal skills to make it? Well, wow, she has in spades. Was she admired? Feared probably more than admired, I think. Um, I mean, lots of people liked her. I, I was very fond of her. I, she was great fun to have. If I was going to a, a dining or debating society dinner, it was a positive if Liz Truss was there, no doubt about it. She, you know, uh, although she might not come across as the most charismatic person, she was fantastic to have around a table debating things and, and you know, it was, it was a pretty, you know, ferocious debater in that environment. She never really got involved in the Oxford Union Debating Society, which is one of the things you would have expected future Prime Ministers to get involved in. You know, Boris Johnson, uh, if they're involved in politics at all, sometimes people emerge having not been involved in politics. But she was involved in politics, but not the Oxford Union. She was much more involved in the student union side and the Liberal Democrats at the time. And yeah, she made quite an impact. So, I mean, if you'd asked me at the time, what are her chances of being Prime Minister? I would have said a, a, a long shot for sure. Uh, if you'd asked me what her chances of being Prime Minister with the enthusiastic support of Jacob Rees-Mogg, I would have said an extreme long shot, but nevertheless that long shot has transpired. Indeed, because she was a confirmed Liberal Democrat uh, at college, wasn't she? She was, although, um, and I can appreciate why people think this might be special pleading on my part, as you know, I consider Liz Truss a friend. But I actually don't think her under, uh, underlying ideology has shifted that much. Yes, OK, she's gone from Republican to constitutional monarchist. She's gone from Liberal Democrat to Conservative. But her basic attitudes were anti-big government, scepticism about the state, hated vested interests, suspicious of the establishment, uh, passionately in favour of individual freedom, staunch supporter of open markets and a capitalist economy. That was true of Liz Truss aged 18 or 19. Now, OK, at that point, she might have been a bit more of a rabble-rousing pro-European Liberal Democrat, but those basic attitudes, as long as she sort of read a book and suddenly switched horses, I think that's been a pretty consistent philosophical approach. Changes in policy position, for sure, quite dramatic changes in policy position, which you might welcome over a period of 25 or 30 years in most people, but not much shift in sort of philosophical attitude, a really quite staggering consistency there. Do you think she'll struggle with advancing plans for uh, more nuclear power stations after her commitment to CND? 
No, I think that I think basically anything from university or prior you can kind of put in one box. I think to to understand the modern Liz Truss, you've probably got to look at her parliamentary career from 2010 onwards. Um, you know, I think she's going to find that she's pushing water uphill a lot as prime minister, and nobody would envy this wicket that she's going to have to come. In. I mean, you wouldn't en- you wouldn't envy the circumstances that she's inheriting this country and on your worst enemy, let alone a colleague and friend. Uh, but no, I don't think, I think her past is colourful and it's interesting about her and it does inform you about the sort of person she is, which, as I say, I think is a much more consistent personality and philosophy than uh, a lot of people would give her credit for if they just look at which colour rosette she was wearing at any given time. Uh, but to understand what she's going to do from now, I think you probably need to understand her parliamentary career from 2010 onwards. And why do you think she's so enthusiastic about taking on the job, the person you describe at university, doesn't sound like she was hungry for power, but more for change. Boundless self-confidence, for sure. She definitely had that in spades. Um, And I think that she will slightly take the kind of cometh the hour, cometh the woman approach to this sort of crisis. She's always been a radical and a maverick. One of the things I still haven't managed to get my head around is how she has loyally served as a cabinet minister for three consecutive prime ministers while simultaneously being an outspoken maverick. I mean, you usually go a pick a lane there, right? And somehow she straddled those two uh, stools, which is quite miraculous. But uh, I haven't seen much of her in recent weeks, but I've seen a bit of her, and everybody tells me she's incredibly calm, relaxed about the situation. I mean, how the hell that's the case is beyond me. You need to be superhuman. I mean, uh, you'd think anyone coming into this uh, this series of crises. So I think she will be quite calm and quite relaxed, and almost if, I suspect this will be true, I wouldn't bet the ranch on it, we're going to see an incredibly radical prime minister. You often only get those in times of crises, and this is sure as hell a time of crises. Uh, what was she like as a as a boss and as a leader? Because we've talked about her in her sort of teens and college years, but we haven't talked about her at work. Uh, yeah, she was uh, incredibly hardworking. Um, she uh, had a great capacity for uh, exploring. Uh, look, fans of of evidence based policy. Making will be clear to know that she approaches things with her head rather than her heart. She'll look at uh, all the data, all the methodology, explore all the potential options. And then crucially, and particularly for a prime minister, she can take a decision. Uh, the wheels of government go up pretty quickly if you have a leader. And I think we saw this with Boris Johnson that, that, that struggles to take clear decisions for good or for ill. So she was uh, she was dispassionate. She was uh, a woman in a hurry, and she was always a woman that was looking for uh, solutions. But you know, in private, you know, when she wasn't, uh, you know, in front of, I think it's fair to say that communication, particularly on a big stage, isn't her strong suit. But in private, she's you know clever, warm, witty, and bright, and has had a political career that's uh, perpetually suffered from the soft bigotry of low expectations. Yeah, I mean, the soft bigotry of low expectations, do you think she's also judged more harshly as a woman? I mean, when we talk about her sort of discomfort in in, in the the glare of publicity and so on, um, you know, there are plenty of men whose whose nervous tics one could zoom in on in that situation. Well, precisely so. And I I mean, Liz is is not one to to whine and and pull the woman card uh, at all. But, you know... You kind of know it when you see it, and it's hard to uh, escape the conclusion that you know uh, lesser men have got away with a great deal more than Liz has been able to do. And as far as I can work out, most of this seems to go back to the fact that you know eight or nine years ago she delivered a, a particularly bad speech, which, uh, whilst a great gift for for memes on social media, I mean, look, we've all done things in our past that make us cringe. Get over it, folks. It's not the it's not the sum total of a, of a person. And when I worked with her, I think one of the first things I did was was get journalists in to meet her on a one-to-one because the Liz you see in private and the Liz that I think we're beginning to see as she's grown in confidence over the leadership campaign uh, is, a, is a different beastie to the, the, you know, the epically bad cheese speech Liz Truss of, of eight or nine years ago. I'm going to come back to you in a second, Kirsty. I just wondered if I could go back to you, Mark. Uh, was she a feminist at, at college? Because uh, Kirsty just talked there about she, you know she'd be the last person to pull the the feminine the the, the 
lady card, if yeah, there is such a thing. I'd love to answer that question straight, Mariella, but I'm not quite sure that I would understand what the definition of a feminist was in mid-90s Oxford. She definitely Well, they would have never... been quite feisty and supportive she... of other women oh, well, she was definitely there campaigning. She was definitely feisty, and she's definitely a woman, but I'd echo what Kirsty has said, absolutely not one iota of special pleading. Absolutely no question that she wanted a leg up in virtue of her gender. Zero. None of it at all uh, has ever been suggested to me. And I rather agree with Kirsty. I think there probably are. They're soft, they're nebulous, they're hard to measure, but probably some bigger over hurdles to overcome. I've never heard her complaining about them once, not from the age of 18, 19 onwards. Interesting. Kirsty, you say that she has a, a very thick skin. Do you think that's a help or can be a hindrance? We were just um, listening to Sarah Baxter there, uh, you know, from, talking to us from New York and talking about the kind of impression the Biden administration might have of, of Liz Truss. And, and I, I think it's fair to say that they might be on the fence in terms of her diplomacy and, 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 and suspicious of a, a degree of what seemed like arrogance was what Sarah Baxter was talking about. Uh, look, uh, I think there's there's two there's two points to being a leader. One is about the you know the head, and one is about the heart. It's part art and it's part science. Now, uh, on the science or on the head bit of it, you know, I think people, particularly in a time of crisis and with the amount of challenges that the new administration is going to face, I think they want a you know a clear-headed, uh, clear thinker who is you know relatively dispassionate and isn't prone to to panicking or giving into bouts of, of you know, a doubt or, you know, inner doubt or, or uncertainty. So from that point of view, uh, it's a plus. I think, I think the downside, if you like, from uh, the amount of challenges that we face at the moment and the, and the fear and the concern that there is in the pub, you know, within the public at the moment with uh, the energy crisis is around communication and connectivity. Now, this is something that you know has been levelled at, at Liz that she you know she a charge against her that she struggles to to speak fluent human if you like I think there's been you know a lot of work done on on making that connection but but ultimately a lot of the restoration of trust here is about delivering delivering for people which is why uh, you know this has been the stress for her she's going to be a woman in a hurry to restore trust by showing that people that she gets it that she gets the scale of concern out there and that she has real, meaningful and significant packages of help on offer to get us through what is going to be, by any measure, an extraordinarily difficult uh, difficult winter. And I, and I don't think certainty mm. is arrogance. I think it's important in a leader. She does. Um, I mean, she sounds uh, at the moment like she's had some serious media training, which which may not help. You know, she sounds like she's, you know, pausing for applause and emphasizing words in the way that I might have done when I first started working in television in my 20s. You know, but hopefully I've got over by now. Do you think that she needs that that sort of uh, training? Do you think it would be better if we did see the Liz Trust that you see behind the scenes rather than, you know, this sort of photo op? I mean, character that that's being presented to us very groomed uh, i mean she she appears to love a photo opportunity particularly if it gives her a chance to dress like margaret thatcher but you know ha, ha, has that been helpful do you think well look, i mean the, the the margaret thatcher thing i think is is part slightly sort of mischief making from liz it, it feels to, well, like i don't know but it feels to me like a sort of classic kind of uh, Liz giving uh, giving the media a, a bit of fun and something to write because she has quite a mischievous sense of humor um, in terms of, of, of the rest of it, look, you know, ultimately uh, it doesn't, you know, what what matters right now is the ability to, to connect and to deliver. Uh, the connectivity, I don't think um, you, you can, you know, you can work too hard on your ability to communicate. But what is important right now is you shift from the pure kind of boosterism language that we saw uh, in the leadership campaign and what we hideously call in comms pivot away from that to a subtler but different message about digging into Britain's can-do attitude. And I think we'll see a shift to a message which is about, look, we are the gov we are the country that, you know, you know, bound together through COVID. We, we, you know, we built hospitals, Nightingale hospitals in two weeks. We delivered a vaccine, we developed and delivered a vaccine in under a year. And an appeal to that can-do spirit alongside uh, an assurance that everything will be done to shield the country and build its resilience and security in the long term. 
Those are the kind of messages that I think we'll see come through. And actually, it's important to work on those and it's important to connect with people. It's not a, it's not a downside for a prime minister. Connectivity is, is everything. Sounds like she should definitely have you in, in Downing Street. Mark, she has become a darling of the free trade movement. You probably won't be surprised by that because you were both members of the Hayek um, Society, uh, weren't you, at Oxford? T yeah, I've got a, I mean, I, insofar as she's had a political journey, I've got a lot of sympathy with her. I'm an ex-Liberal Democrat. I was at the Oxford Liberal, uh, Liberal Club when, when she was, and I consider myself a free trade, classical liberal, and I think, you know, her, her basic views of the world and mine are, uh, are pretty similar. She's become a darling of, I'm not quite sure what you would call it, the neoliberal wing, the classical liberal wing, the pro-free market wing of the Conservative Party. But as I say, I think that's pretty, um, I think that's completely aligned with being a classical liberal. Uh, she's not necessarily a darling of the social conservatives, the kind of paleo conservatives, not at all. Uh, she's, incredibly, uh, she's incredibly socially liberal, um, but I'm unsurprised that those in the Conservative Party who yearn for open markets, lower taxes, thinks there's too much regulation. I'm completely unsurprised that they've flocked to her banner. She's been their natural champion for several years now. Uh, Marx stood up there, Kirsty, for her changes of heart over the years. Um, how do you account for her, you know, all of these changes of views? Is it, is it flip-flopping? Is it pursuit of power? Is she, you know, actually far more ambitious and determined uh, to have, you know, has she been chasing this job for, for quite some time? Or, or is it a journey, as they like to say these days? Yeah, I've never, of all the things I don't understand, I've never understood why growth and, and changing your opinions as the, you know, events change around you, as it were, is, is necessarily a bad thing. If you don't grow in your political philosophy, you end up with Jeremy Corbyn, whose whose worldview is entirely kind of stuck in the 1980s. So uh, growth is a good thing. I don't, I assume that there is some kind of underlying sneer here that, that this is about opportunism. You know, this is a woman that has navigated away from the court of Osborne through Theresa May, through Boris Johnson, and is now the Prime Minister. She has guile. But she don't you think that's what makes people? Good. Don't you think that's what makes people suspicious? That's what makes for a good politician. You look if you're hungry for change and you think you have the the right stuff to deliver change. You cannot deliver change in opposition, and you cannot deliver it from a position of no power. So, it is a natural belief in you know in most politicians uh, not just Liz Truss that they've got the right stuff to get to the top very few do but most of them are driven by the belief that they've got the right stuff to get there mm. George, just finally, you know, bearing in mind all of the people that you've spoken to in, in gathering the Liz Truss story together, do you think that she's a person, because the, the other huge challenge, along with the energy crisis and the cost of living crisis and everything with the crisis, is the, the conservative crisis. You know, she won by 57% to Rishi Sunak's 43%. It is a divided party. Is she the woman who can unite it? The margin is certainly much, much lower than she, she would have been hoping for. I think it will be a challenge. This is a Conservative Party, let's not forget, that has been in government for 12 years. But Liz has been the great survivor of all these different administrations. She's the longest serving cabinet minister. She's managed to sort of uh, campaign for Remain and then win over the Brexiteer. She's managed to pursue budget cuts in her departments under austerity. And now she's saying that she's going to tackle Treasury orthodoxy and... and go on this tax cutting spree so if there's ever someone who is able to sort of be malleable and, and flexible with these times uh, she's she's got a good chance but she inherits a, a pretty uh, nasty picture with the economy and and everything at the moment Kirsty, just finally uh, what would you like to see in her speech this afternoon uh, I'd like to see, uh, like I say, a switch to a, 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 pr a real promise that she understands uh, the scale of the challenges facing people. She understands how frightened people are at the moment and she will do everything in her power to deliver and protect them through what is going to be a really grim winter.